Well, we, we liquid cooled it. This is the Intel NUC. It's the Hades Canyon one that Intel and Andy worked on together. The cooler is now significantly larger than the product. And what we've done is we stuck a Be Quiet Silent Loop 280 on top of the CPU and the GPU, which are on the same substrate, but they're not the same silicon. One is a Vega M GPU from AMD. The other is an Intel i7 CPU. Between the two of them, there's a good amount of power that we need to, dis to cool and dissipate. And plugging it into the wall as well, we were pushing upwards of 200 watts draw during some of our tests. So it was time for some liquid cooling to see how far we could overclock the Hades Canyon Nook. Before that, this is brought to you by the MSI GTX 1080 Gaming X and NVIDIA's GeForce Experience, which allows you to retroactively capture key gameplay moments with shadow play, convert captures into GIFs with new tools, and apply filters to games, hashtag no filter. MSI's Gaming X PCBs are high quality with well-built power management and coolers that we've previously recommended. Learn more at the links in the description below. So our goal here was to see if we could hit five gigahertz. That's kind of the magic nice round number for Intel CPUs. We were hitting about 4.2 to 4.3 previously with the stock cooled Intel NUC, and that was just using a couple of the blower fans that come with it. These right here and an aluminum fin stack, basically. Pretty simple, but we were running into thermal limitations. The liquid cooling should resolve that pretty handily. The biggest concerns we have here, of course, are going to be VRM cooling because we've removed the heatsink from the VRMs and the cold plate here doesn't contact them. So we can solve that pretty easily. A fan, high RPM fan right next to it. It blows air across the uh, cold plate for whatever parts of the cold plate are exposed. And then also across the VRM components, they're fine. So that takes care of that problem very easily. And then we also had to resolve mounting pressure. There's not a good solution to that other than maybe a clamp like a woodworking clamp, just stick it on there with a non-conductive surface in between the clamp and the PCB or something. But we ended up just relying on the zip ties for now. It's not the best solution. Our biggest weak point with this whole project is the mounting pressure. However, it still worked and it worked pretty well, just I think partly because of the brute force solution of using a 280 millimeter liquid cooler with two maglev fans from Corsair and another NDXT fan blowing air across the VRMs, that's a pretty good brute force method to fix everything. So previously, 4.2 gigahertz to 4.3, hitting 95 plus degrees Celsius, depending on what we were testing, and that was on the CPU. GPU was also getting pretty warm, 60s, 70s, depending on the workload. Let's get into the new overclocking results before this section. We're planning to do a live stream with this version of the Intel NUC, the Hades Canyon hybrid, as we're calling it. So I don't know if this video will go before or after the live stream, but we'll be doing a live stream and trying to push further than we got for this video. So if the live stream is online, go check the results of it because we might have gotten further. And if it's not, then stick around and come back tomorrow. But basically, we ended up at 4.7 gigahertz. So we got an extra 400 megahertz to 500 megahertz, depending on what we were testing. 4.7, very stable. We offset the voltage 0 0.06 volts. And in CPU intensive workloads that are 100% CPU, we were still running into some thermal issues. But for other tests like Firestrike, as you'll see momentarily, we had temperature drops upwards of 30 plus degrees Celsius, 40 in the case of some overclocking temperatures versus stock air cooling. Significant reductions. But again, at times with CPU loads that were really abusive, we'd still end up in the 90s. And that was at 4.7 gigahertz. So uh, we are presently bound by either voltage or silicon quality or something like that. Uh, so the plan is to, at some point, fix the mounting pressure or put an even bigger cooler on it. We also did CL19 for the memory. That seems reasonably stable. CL192933 for the, they just sent us HyperX memory with the Nook. We're using the high-end one that's like $1,200. And with an i7 and the Vega M high-end mobile Vega version of the GPU. We were between 1340 and 1370 megahertz on the GPU, it tended to be 1370. That's up from 1320 megahertz on the GPU. We're at 950 megahertz max, 935 sometimes for HBM2, depending on how stable the game is. And that's up from 900 megahertz on HBM2. We had to down clock for a couple of games. Overall though, between four to 500 megahertz extra on the CPU overclock, and then 50 megahertz extra on the GPU overclock, 50 megahertz extra on the HBM2 overclock, depending on the title. That's pretty damn good for just brute force cooling. So let's go over some of the power numbers and thermals 
and see how those look. We thought we'd be running into power limitations with the higher overclock. A logging power meter put us at around 190 watts for Firestrike Extreme, but about 150 watts for CPU-only benchmarks like when we use Blender to render things. We were at 200 watts peak under any load conditions, and some games were about that high. The power brick is the next consideration, not one that we had considered actually. It's 230 watts for the brick. So it's, I think it's 11.8 amps at 19.5 volts. It puts you about 230 watts, you multiply the two together. So we could potentially become limited, but we're at 200 watts peak and that's at the wall measurement. So that's before efficiency loss and things like that. So uh, we're pretty much towards the upper or the, the limits of that power brick. To get any further beyond it, we'd have to like grab a similarly rated laptop power supply at 300 watts or something and solder the end onto it or something like that. I don't really know the best solution, but that'd be the, the next limiter. After thermal, which we've somewhat solved, and after voltage, we're limited by power. So uh, thermally though, let's go over those numbers. The hybrid mod under stock conditions operated at about 33 degrees cooler in CPU temperature than the stock configuration. Not bad considering our mounting pressure isn't the best here. It just goes to show how much brute force can make up for other deficiencies. Our overclock had us about four degrees warmer than stock and GPU thermals were also dropped about 30 degrees down from 73 degrees Celsius. We're also cooler than the stock 100% fan configuration while being significantly quieter at around 42 dBA versus north of 50 dBA. Even SSD motherboard and other temperatures are significantly reduced, though less impressive than CPU and GPU temperatures. We have more overclocking headroom now and will likely run into, again, voltage or power walls before thermal walls, but we could further improve thermals by clamping down that cold plate a bit harder. And again, there's one scenario where our thermals don't look as good as the previous charts, and that would be in a 100% CPU torture workload i.e. a generally synthetic power virus workload where in ongoing CPU targeted stress tests with FFTs or something like that, we're still hitting almost 100 degrees Celsius. We're between 90 and 94 on some cores, but not all, which again would be indicative of a potential mounting pressure difference. Not a surprise given how we've mounted the cooler to the board. Really not, not surprising anyone. So yeah, uh, that's again, biggest weakness. But overall, it's doing pretty well. The VRMs are kept completely within spec. They're well under 100 degrees and uh, well under. And that's just from a 2000 RPM fan on it. So total non-issue for the VRMs. Not really practical, but for cases, uh, purposes of overclocking, it's completely fine. We'll start our game testing the same way we did in the review. Remember, we didn't know what to expect for the initial review. So we started with our low end GPU test suite before moving up to higher end DGPU benchmarks after seeing the relative performance of Hades Canyon. Starting with Rocket League at 1080p and relatively high settings, we observed Hades Canyon stock at 162 FPS average with lows proportionately behind at 118 and 96 FPS. Hades Canyon with stock cooling and an overclock received an impressive 12% performance uplift and that's from a 4.3 gigahertz all-core turbo and 1320 megahertz GPU core, 900 megahertz on the HPM. Going to 4.7 gigahertz and 1350 to 935 megahertz on the GPU components gave us an uplift of 5% over the previous overclock. Not a ton, but we think we could get more with further tuning, which is something again, we'll consider doing on a live stream if you all show interest. Leave a comment below if you're interested in that. One more reference before moving on to the higher end testing. For Dota 2 with DX11, we saw a performance baseline of 126 FPS average complete stock, which gained 9% performance with an overclock and stock cooling air from the original build. Our liquid mod moved us up to 145 FPS average, a jump of 6% over the previous overclock's 137 FPS average, or a jump of 16% over the 126 FPS baseline. Not bad at all for something that is really basically laptop components. For Honor is our first intensive high-end DGPU benchmark. At 1080p extreme settings, we measured the original Hades Canyon Nook at 59 FPS average, with the original overclock version of the Nook gaining 10.7%, landing at 65 FPS average. The liquid-cooled version didn't improve much, getting stuck at around 68 FPS average, a gain of 5%, comparable to previous data. 
That puts our NUC as nearing the RX 470 and i7-7700K for performance, where the RX 470 is not bound by the CPU. We treat Ashes of the Singularity like a synthetic benchmark for these, so it's unrealistically configured to 4K and high settings. Again, that's because it's a synthetic tool, 4% scaling between high-end GPUs. The stock NUC operated at 30 FPS with the stock cooling overclock at 33.6 FPS. Again, that's in the 50s for decibels because we're at 100% fan speeds. The hybrid mod is at 34.8 FPS here. That puts our hybrid at 16% faster than the stock air-cooled unit, or about 3.6% ahead of the air-cooled overclock, not as impressive. We're way ahead of the 1050 Ti in performance, partly thanks to using DX12 with Ashes and a bit behind the RX 470. Sniper Elite gives us a Vulkan and asynchronous compute workload to consider, where Polaris and Vega tend to be advantaged by architecture. This one is also the least exciting. We gained from 72 FPS to 80.8 FPS average with our previous tests for about an 11.6% improvement. With the hybrid mod, we were within margin of error for improvement, and it seems that we're bumping into other limitations with this title, something we'll explore if we do a live stream overclock. So we didn't quite make it to five gigahertz yet, but there are a few tricks I have here. One of them is potentially just fixing some of the thermal limitations further because even if we're running a non-CPU benchmark where we're not thermally limited with this mod, we're in like the 40s or 50s sometimes for temperature, even in those scenarios, having a better cooler can still help because we'll reduce power leakage. In our previous testing, we found and published that roughly every 10 degree reduction in CPU temperature results in about a 4% reduction in power consumption from leakage. So if we can further reduce the thermals, to a point that we somewhat reduce the power leakage, that'll give us just a couple extra watts to play with out of the 230 watt limited power brick without having to hard mod that brick, which we'd really prefer not to do, although it'd be an interesting project. I'm just not sure how it'd turn out because we're not as experienced with that. But again, I don't know about five gigahertz. We can definitely push to 4.8 because it's semi-stable. A bit more voltage would stabilize it. That could be achievable in some benchmarks, like Firestrike, we'd probably pass those, but not Blender or Prime. And more mounting pressure with a clamp would fix any of those limitations too. So we've got room to do more and push this further. We definitely have room to push the memory further, because uh, it's currently CL19 and 2933 megahertz. But that's where we'll leave it for now. Either way, a lot of fun for the project. This thing is not exactly a work of art, okay, but it's functional. And you have to give credit because a 30 to 40 degree drop in some of the temperature values we saw is pretty substantial. And that did absolutely give us 400 to 500 megahertz more on the CPU and an extra 50 megahertz on the GPU core, extra 50 on the HPM. Overall, a massive uplift, but I would like to push it further. So make sure you subscribe. If we haven't already done a live stream at this point, then subscribe so you can get it when it comes out, I don't know, in the next few days. And if you, if we did do the live stream, go watch it if you haven't and find out if we got any further than we did here. So uh, that's it for now. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Go to store.gamersnexus.net if you're interested in seeing what these things are because they're new and we're getting them in pretty soon. So you can go there and learn more about each of these items. And uh, we'll talk about those more in the future as well. Or go to the same place for the GN anti-static mod mat. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.